Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Dr. Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new Teen Therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. His latest book, Feeling Great, contains powerful new techniques that make rapid recovery possible for many people struggling with depression and anxiety. Dr. Burns is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. (laughs) Hello, Rhonda. (laughs) Hello, David, and welcome to all of our listeners across the country and around the world. This is episode 298. David and I are happy to announce that there will be the first ever Team CBT World Congress, August 18 through the 21st, to be held in Warsaw, Poland. Licensed therapists, lay people, and therapists in training are welcome to attend the Congress in person in Warsaw or join us online at a reduced registration fee. During these four days, an international team faculty, many of whom have been featured on this podcast, will present the entire team model from start to finish, from testing to methods. The Congress will feature interactive sessions in which participants can learn and practice all elements of the powerful team system while receiving expert coaching on team techniques. There will also be special topic workshops that will address trauma, cancer care, and low-intensity team CBT. All information about the Congress is available at www.teamcbt.eu. That is www.teamcbt.eu. We look forward to seeing you there. And I, I always say that we have wonderful guests, but today we have a really exciting guest that I'd love to welcome. He's a professor at Columbia Business School, where he's been the professor since 2004. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what he's, what he's doing there and why he's on a Feeling Good podcast. Hitendra Wadwa, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Thank you. Okay. And he's also the founder of the Mentora Institute, since 2000, which he founded in 2011. And that is an institute where he's created a new model of leadership um, for business. And, and that I'm imagining that came out of the, the wonderful class that he teaches called Personal Leadership and Success at the Columbia Business School, where his goal is to bring out the best in others and in ourselves by using using leadership and to have success in life and leadership that originates from within. And I'm, I'm sure we'll be talking more about that. Let me just ex- introduce you a little bit more. Hatendra has an MBA and he has a PhD in management science from MIT's Sloan School of Management. So welcome to our podcast. Thank you, Rhonda. It's um, a joy and a privilege to be, be here with uh, both of you and, and your listeners. Yes, and the most exciting thing is that in June, uh, you know, as our podcast is being published, you are publishing your new book called Inner Mastery, Outer Impact, and I imagine we'll be talking about that, and I was lucky enough to read parts of it be- to prepare for this podcast, and it's it's really fascinating, especially, you know, coming, f- it's very psychological coming from a business perspective. Yes, Um you know, David, in no small measure, is partly responsible for that with the um, um, mentoring and guidance I've uh, benefited from, you know, from David in, in years past and uh, continue to. Uh, but it was my intent, both in the book and the class that I'm teaching at Columbia, to really strive to bring a new depth and awareness to organizations, businesses, leaders uh, that, um, um, you know, there are capacity in each of us to dive within and to um manifest goodness resilience clarity of thought etc from from within and then projected on the outside is is critical you know especially in today's complex and fast changing times mm, cool well um i i can't wait to dive in i thought first i would read 
one um, endorsement about a previous podcast that we published, and this was on um, our episode 294, which is called Acceptance Revisited, and that was with, you know, our very special guest when we do Ask David episodes, Dr. Matt May, and Ed G. wrote us, what a memorable podcast this was. I was so impressed with the recap of your interaction with the radiologist, your suggestion that the radiologist obtain additional training and his willingness to do so. And, you know, people have to listen to that podcast to understand the specifics of this endorsement. Um, But basically, um, Ed wrote that he was taken aback when you mentioned um, the late, great Dr. Ellis because because Ed is a student of CBT and he loved reading his books and watching his YouTube sessions and he's um, excited that David and Matt talked about how David you saved this radiologist's career and the well-being of many of his patients that would have suffered if he hadn't worked with you so well, we we often get heartwarming notes from uh, EDG, and I greatly appreciate it. I have a question. For you. I know Rhonda has has a lot of them, but I, I have a few too. And and I, I know when we first met, you were on a kind of journey that I'm sure started long before we met, and you were lo- looking for something. You were teaching uh, kind of inner mastery to your students at uh, at Columbia, but you were also going around, you, you found me, uh, I first met you at one of my workshops, in, I think St. Louis or someplace in the Midwest, and uh, you, you were very keen to learn, and I, and I know you went to a lot of teachers of various kinds or gurus or people promoting this, that, and the other, other thing to try to distill what was really valid and, and really helpful. And your book now, uh, Inner Mastery, Outer Impact, I think is probably the culmination or one of the culminations of that of that journey you've been on. And I know you've been working on an inner level as well with your uh, intense dedication to med- meditation that you, I, you've probably been at since you were three years old or something like that. And I know when I visited your class, I was in and uh, had the honor to, to teach the students a little bit about cognitive therapy and also the five secrets of effective communication. I was impressed how aggressive they were in a negative way uh, that, you know, the uh, Rhonda and I have the Tuesday group at Stanford where everyone is very kind of loving and and humble and, you know, a little on the insecure side. And the environment really, really kind of shocked me uh, because it was competitiveness plus, plus, plus. And so it was really neat that you were trying to provide direction in a more philosophical in a more sophical direction there. And so I'd love to hear about your voyage and also your amazing idea that uh, some of the uh, uh, modern ideas that we have about, you know, cognitive distortions and various techniques that can help people overcome depression and anxiety uh, are actually based on ancient teachings going back not 2,000 years, but maybe three or 4,000 years. So now I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> yeah, that's... Um... That's a lot to take in, and uh, you've taken me down memory lane, and, and so much of that, David. Um, I remember when I first uh, sought to uh, learn more about the cutting edge of uh, mental health, and uh, you know, discovered your work, uh, and uh, initially sought to reach out to you, and you know, realized that you were going to actually present in my own neighborhood, you know, in Washington D.C. I mean, close enough to New York um, that I entrained to actually be in one of your classes, recognizing that it would be a little bit odd, you know, for me as a business professor to be there with a psychotherapist, but but who knows? Uh, and uh, I unfortunately, you did so well in that workshop that you were able to wrap things up. I think um, 
you know, about 45 minutes before the end of, you know, the, 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 the scheduled end. And so you had actually left the hotel <laughs> just around the time that I actually showed up there because I was hoping to catch you at the back end and just kind of meet you, you know, just there. Uh, and so I'm missing you, you know, at that point. I thought that was going to be the end of my, you know, foray into the world of David Burns. But then, uh, like you said, in St. Louis, we actually were able to meet and I was able to come and participate in the to their, to their workshop, which was, you know, powerful, transformative for so many who were there and including me. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful that a path crossed now in this way today where we are looking back at what that journey has meant. Um, as you said, um, you know, in the business world, um, you know, every community, every discipline has its culture and looked at from the outside can look, um, you know, fascinating, but also a little bit strange. Uh, and so I'm, I'm not surprised at this juxtaposition of, you know, you, uh, you know, as, as Dr. David Burns and, and the business school students may, may have led to some, some interesting chemistry. Um, I know that you had a tremendous impact, you know, on the students, you know, that day that you were with us and, you know, you've come and done it a couple of times and uh, it's been tremendously powerful and transformative for them to realize that outside of these outer ambitions that they have been trained to have, which is the kind of like can do type A personality that I think a business school traditionally attracts. Outside of that, there is a deep space of inner possibilities through which they can get to discover more about their authentic voice and their true self, and then seek to engage with the world from a place of deeper integration and harmony and uh, clarity of like you know purpose than perhaps they may have you know otherwise been um, invested in doing you know in the business world. And I think today that kind of soul searching is starting to happen increasingly. So I think uh, we in that experiment we ran and having you in the, be in the class were a little bit ahead of our times. Today, this whole theme, for example, of human-centered organizations, human-centered leadership, the empathetic leader, the um, the idea of um, you know a whole person self being brought into work, the mental health challenges that are starting to get uh, to trickle into people's work lives, and you know, not just you know not just at home and in society. You know, all of those are awakening us to the fact that you know uh, this was much needed. This um, you know, this discipline of slowing life down, looking within, doing the appropriate sort of reflection and, you know, re, um, you know, re-architecting of uh, components of our inner life in order to show up, you know, that much more as a connected and harmonious and ultimately, um, yeah, adaptable self. Uh, so uh, I'm grateful for the journey that I was able to make in part triggered, you know, David, by so much wisdom that I acquired, you know, through, through working with you. Well, you've, you've talked to so many people and you do such beautiful interviews on your own web, webinar and, and your announcements that you sent out ahead of time on who, who you're featuring and why. It's all just so beautifully done. What, what would be a simple example? I, I, I like to think about teaching at the fourth grade level because that's about where I'm at most of the time. And let, let's say one of our listeners wants to know, well, how 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 do you get this uh, outer impact from inner mastery what are we talking about Wh whether i'm a business person or a, a lay person uh just le learning to want to improve my my mood my life my relationships how to tell us uh, how this this inner and outer thing uh w what would be a, a nice example of that yeah i mean i I'll, I'll, I'll share a couple of examples um one was from the time that I used to uh, work at McKinsey and Company, which is a um, you know storied name in the you know global strategy consulting world. And uh, when I was there, uh, I remember this one time where I was feeling um, you know really un unhappy with one of my peers. You know, I was in my first few months of being at McKinsey because I found that he was always trying to upend me when I was presenting my work. You know, he would want to you know, point holes and gaps and, you know, kind of like tell me what I should do differently and better. And this was visible in front of some of the senior partners, you know, at, at my firm. And, I, you know, I was at a place where I wanted to create a good impression with them. And I feel like he was foiling my chances of doing that, and, you know. And so for about like, you know, three weeks or so, I was carrying, you know, a little bit of that grudge, you know, on my shoulders every time we were having these team review, you know, interactions. And then at one point, um, one of the, like my, my project manager, what we used to call it McKinsey engagement manager. Now he came up to me and, and, he, and he said, hey, Tendra, you, 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 you know, like Dan, um, you know, I'd like you to be more like Dan. And, and I was thinking, wait a second, he's talking about the same guy who's my public enemy number mm -hmm. one, my peer, who's, you know, this very sort of bragging about himself and, you know, super salesy, you know, kind of aggressive person. 
Uh, and he said, I know, I'd like you to be more like that. And I was like, you know, can you tell me more what you mean? <laughs> uh, and he said, look, what I notice is that when we have these team reviews, Dan is like all in. He listens and tunes in, not just when he's presenting his stuff, but also when you are presenting your stuff. And he seeks to help you take your game to the next level. And that's what we are all here for. Of course, each of us has our responsibilities, but we're also here to help each other because we want to ultimately be committed to bringing the best solution to our clients. So I'm glad that he's you know, getting to you know, offer you some learnings and insight. And I would like you to do that as well. But I notice that you, you know, start to tune out and you become very quiet after your part of the presentation is done. I tell you, it was like a you know, bolt from the blue, like a light bulb that went off in my head. I just made the shift in my energy state in some ways, because I realized that here I was actually thinking that the name of the game was to come out shining, looking perfect in what you do. And now he's telling me, actually, you don't need to look perfect. You need to collect the intelligence and ideas of others in the room. That's the whole point of this review. And in doing so, even if somebody's your peer, there's no reason why you can't actually contribute you know, to them as well. And so all of these, if you want to call it like David in your language, self-defeating beliefs, that were inside me, were getting challenged and vanquished. You know, a, a belief that this is about like me versus this other peer, I have to outshine him. You know, that was a self-defeating belief. Mm -hmm. You know, th this idea that if somebody criticizes my work or points a gap or hole in it, that means I don't look good. That was a self-defeating belief. You know, this idea that I better just watch out for myself and other people are smart enough to watch out for themselves and that's how we create a you know, great team. That was a self-defeating belief. Um, and so I found so much potential in the ideas and thoughts that you and other pioneers in the field of CBT have developed to help us understand some of these inner constraints and handcuffs that we unnecessarily, invisibly, unconsciously impose on ourselves, that if we were able to you know, put them aside, you know, there would be just so much more potential we could unleash both individually and collectively. Yeah, so that, I love that. So just to summarize it, uh, and, and we'll let Rhonda shoot some questions your, your way. You used what, as you know, we'd call disarming and stroking to, to win this fellow over instead of withdrawing or getting angry or, or even worse, defending yourself, decided to turn him into an ally by finding truth in what he said, learning from him, stroking to him, uh, uh, showing him uh, a, a lot of r r respect. And that in addition, to learning those verbal communication techniques, you have to change, that's the outer uh, game. You have to change your inner game, change your, your beliefs, your, your, your perfectionism. You're, you're seeing it as, you know, me versus you, that we're involved in a battle, a, a, a battle competition, and to, to see it uh, collaboratively instead. Now, sometimes these uh, points of view that we have function as self-fulfilling prophecies and, and certainly seeing him as the enemy was functioning as a self-fulfilling prophecy when you changed your mindset and and way of re relating to this fellow what 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 happened was this the one that you told me that you had a fist fight with <laughs> <laughs> i'm just both pulling your leg but what how did it evolve i i probably had some mental fist fights just <laughs> uh, but um yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it completely changed uh, not just um, that dynamic, it actually just uh, changed my whole trajectory in the organization because I started to understand the dynamics of a positive, high-performing workplace in a very different way from the, you know, naive kind of limiting views I had before. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I always had like a, you know, like a reasonably good social, you know, relationship with, with this you know, person since we were spending four days outside of our homes in the client locations, you know, Monday to Thursday, every, every week, we often would do dinners and other things together. And, you know, those were cordial and good and fun conversation, but there, there was always, you know, this heaviness in my heart about like, why does this guy do these things? But I, I just didn't have a vehicle, a voice, you know, through which to kind of like really, if I would had, you know, training in your uh, five secrets, you know, at that time, perhaps I would have been in a better position to more proactively deal with this. Instead, I got a little bit of this, um, you know, good nature, you know, kind of like whack, you know, from my engagement manager to kind of coach me and uh, that woke me up and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Now, you've got this beautifully um, produced and written and fantastically thought out book, many years of inner mastery and outer impact. Suppose somebody is listening to the 
podcast right now and thinking, well, gosh, I'd like to have more inner mastery and outer impact. What are some of the kinds of things that they might expect to learn in, in, in the book? Yeah, and- no. Thank you. Thank you, David. I, I, I think the most important learning I would offer is an invitation to go on this quest to discover what it means to be true to yourself. And um, we are living at a time today when we are seeking to unshackle ourselves from so many of the impositions and constraints and demands and expectations of our parents and of our churches and of our governments and others of the world. And that's a beautiful thing, this quest for freedom to express in a free way, like your own, you know, your own potential, your own, you know, identity, your own uh, tastes and, you know, and personality, et cetera. But in doing so, I think we're also ending up... um, hurting in, in many ways, you know, um, with, with the, um, you know, the growing concerns we have about depression and mental health and suicide and other such, uh, you know, painful forces that have been unleashed in society, drug addictions, which, um, you know, many of which are things that you have done such noble work in helping to treat. Um, and why is that? Why is that when we become freer, we actually end up becoming in some ways, you know, closer to this kind of suffering? And one thesis that I want to offer to you is that, you know, perhaps we haven't really taken on this mantle of being true to ourselves and being authentic in the way we, 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 we should. I mean, because when I look at myself, at least when I look within, I don't have one self. Who am I going to be true to? You know, I have so many different selves. There's a part of me that wants to please you. There's a part of me that wants to please myself. There's a part of me that wants to pursue a certain addiction. There's a part of me that wants to be very self-disciplined. You know, so, I mean, there's just so many conflicting parts of me. And so, one of the key theses in this book is that know thyself by recognizing that there are many false friends within. And it is when we regulate and become aware and team and redirect some of these, if you want to call it like, you know, more un- un- unproductive impulses that we get to that crown jewel that lies within each of us. And I call that your inner core. And that's a space of highest potential in us. It's a place from where, you know, we are beyond ego and attachments and insecurities and we can just shine through. And when we let that be activated and expressed in everything we do, we naturally so do not need guidebooks and teachers on the outside because we have the greatest wealth of wisdom, resilience, and clarity from, from within in activating that core. I, uh, I, I found so much in uh, the way you, David, talk about drifting in and out of enlightenment. Mm-hmm. You know, So if I were to borrow that language from you, then the being in enlightenment to me is analogous to this idea of being at your core and drifting out of enlightenment is the moment where we start having misjudgments and we start you know feeling unhappy and we start struggling with life and so um what the book does is basically offer five pathways to get to that core and express it in all we do uh, a pathway of purpose of wisdom of growth of self-realization and of love and um and, and then seeks to invite us to say that okay when we are leading like when we're seeking to bring out the best in others as well, whether it's in our homes as parents or family members or in our community or, or at work, well, leading is nothing but just like lighting up that core within others as well, uh, which again is something you do so beautifully through your five secrets, right? Which is when, when other people are lit up at that core and I'm lit up at my core, then magic can happen together. Yeah, that's neat. I'll let you take over. I have a million more questions, but I'm hogging the show here. So well, that's to okay. you, Rhonda. <laughs> I did have one. You know, I was really interested, but I'm glad you brought up your four, your five core energies. And um, just to say them again, you, you mentioned purpose, wisdom, growth, love, and self-realization. And in my experience, working with clients who are involved in you know, competitive business world, these are not um, value. I don't see that these are being valued, especially you write, you write about love. And I don't hear much about love when you're in a competitive business world. I was just talking to somebody today who was really upset and learn, learning the five secrets because his supervisor is constantly criticizing him. And, um, you know, where you write that love is that we're all connected and we should take joy in other people's joy and successes. I mean, that would be, that's such a, that's so, such a value, a valuable energy to bring to business. And are you finding that people are taking on your, the core energies that you, you're noting? Yeah, I, I, I think that it's, it's, a, it's, it's probably one of the most important, I think, um, issues that you are bringing up in the relationship between the five energies and the business world 
they get very drawn to wisdom. They get very drawn to growth. They get very drawn to purpose. It's a very can-do, you know, achievement-oriented sort of energy. Self-realization and love, you know, those are some of the bigger leaps, you know, for them. Um, and uh, on the topic of love, um, the 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 misimpression we have is that love makes you weak. That mm -hmm. in a competitive world, love you know, will make people take advantage of you. Uh, and instead, more and more today, there is research to show there are you know, historical studies that we can also point to to show that some of those individuals, you know, who have really shone through in the way they have led, including in really difficult conditions at times with, you know, uh, with arch enemies on the other side, that love has been an incredibly powerful force to activate and stir the human spirit. Um, in the business world, for example, you look at Herb Keller and the culture that he created at Southwest, you know, over you know, two, three decades, which was really grounded in the idea of um, um, helping, you know, keep their employees who do really hard and difficult work, you know, running an airline is not easy, uh, keeping them really happy. Um, and, and then their happiness, he said, would lead to customers being happy and customers' happiness would lead to customers returning for more business, and then we would make more money, and then the investors would be happy. So the idea of obsessing with returns to shareholders and making sure that we are profitable is the outcome, not the immediate intention. It's the outcome of creating a space for a loving, connected energy at work. Um, that was the Herb Keller approach for which he became very successful. Then Brian Chesky, for instance, at Airbnb has done something very similar. He's, he's, he actually uses very actively the language of love, which Southwest also uses. Um, and he talks very much about how much he loves, you know, you know, all the employees. And even at a time when he had to lay people off at the early stages of the COVID, um, you know, um, you know, craziness from two years ago, when the travel industry was in a tizzy and he had to do some, you know, thoughtful restructuring, he laid them off with love. He laid them off with love. And so, um, so one of the key things that I, you know, do when we are invoking this energy of love in executive and MBA classrooms is to help people observe that you still have a responsibility to not just love the person just in front of you, from the vantage point of being kind and thoughtful and generous and empathetic to and accommodating of them, but also to love the larger cause that you're serving, love the team that you and they are part of, love their future self, not just their present self. And if you are gonna hide you know, uncomfortable truths, if you're not gonna make the hard decisions or calls that sometimes with consideration have to be made, then you are postponing you know, ultimately you know, the inevitable. And if not today, tomorrow, they're gonna get a root shock. Tomorrow, you're gonna run your business into the ground, et cetera. Why not actually face those moments today, but do them from a place of deep caring? Uh, and the paradox here is that the more you can bring caring and heart and kindness and compassion and love into your energy, your facial expressions, your tone, the way you engage with people, the decisions you make, the more you can bring more of that in. In a sense, the more license people give you to being very direct with them, being very hard on them, <laughs> making tough calls along the way, you know, holding them accountable and responsible. Somehow that paradox works. You know, if you do it with love, people actually really open themselves up to it. And I mean, David, no small measure has been, you know, a tremendous uh, testament to that for me because, you know, I've seen you, David, like do some of these uh, five secret sessions, you know, at times with people to help train them. And, uh, you know, I can just see the kind of magic you're able to weave by putting so much heart and compassion and empathy that you also open people up to, listening to your agenda and your message and the ask that you have of them. Yeah, magic is definitely possible. Hell is possible too, <laughs> you know, depending on the mindset that you bring into a situation. And we're all kind of uh, attracted to a certain extent, I think, to the dark side. And so these things sound good, but they re require some some discipline and, and, and effort and conscious desire to to move in a particular direction um, i i know that you're uh, one who practices what, what he preaches uh, and you've already given us given us a good example with this fellow who was always uh, seemingly trying to bust you and turn him into a teacher rather than turning him in, into an, an enemy. Uh, can you give us other examples where you've uh, f found that the things that you're teaching and writing about in your book, uh, uh, you know, inner mastery, outer impact, <clears throat> have, have affected your 
your career, because I know you've solved dozens, if not hundreds or thousands of problems that have come up when you're trying to achieve your, your own goals and create your Menorah Institute and your, your fabulous uh, seminars and, and webinars uh, and, and interviews with, 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 with people. And then I also want to ask you what, what you thought about Zelensky. Yeah. Um, in terms okay. of inner mastery, outer impact. Yeah, maybe I can start with the latter uh, then, uh, David. Uh, so I have pointed to Zelensky, actually written a couple of LinkedIn posts, you know, about, about him in the last month uh, and um, highlighted how um, in, in today's time, he does, you know, in so many ways, exemplify this capacity for any or all of us to go on a hero's journey by activating the core in ourselves and others around us. I mean, Ukraine, you know, God bless, you know, everyone there, um, you know, hasn't necessarily, you know, been uh, an exceptionally, you know, more courageous culture than any other, you know, that I'm aware of. I spent some time there in, in Kiev and it was beautiful to be there. It's a beautiful people. But yet what they have been able to achieve and do in the present times by activating, you know, that heroic state within them is, we know, to the whole world, really, you know, uh, remarkable, right? And, um, and where does that come from? You know, it was always there. It's always there in each and every one of us. But that sense of unity and clarity of mission and capacity to self-sacrifice and let your family go in one place and you, you stay back and be in harm's way and, you know, to kind of protect the freedoms of your country. And I mean, so Zelensky, obviously, a key part of that. I also think that him being a comedian was initially laughed at and mocked about in, 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 in certain media that I saw in the early stages, you know, of um, his leadership and, and even of the war. Uh, but over time, you've seen that he actually has been a very effective leader. And so one of the things I've observed is that we limit ourselves when we see our strengths being, you know, just, um, you know, kind of like uh, tied very just uh, singularly to a particular profession. You know, we, we think about strengths and training as coming from a certain professional and technical background. But in his case, for instance, the, you know, the strength of being a comedian means that you are deeply tuned into your audience. And when you go to a new audience, you tune into them, their hungers, their highs, their lows. Uh, what is it that makes life tick for them? What are their frustrations? Which clearly he has shown, not just with his own people, but when he's gone around the world doing these uh, pr you know, presentations to the United Nations and the American Congress and the British Parliament, he's tuned in you know, to those audiences, to those people. Then you know, I think being a comedian actually gives you a sense of meta perspective. You know, you're able to step back from the fray of life, the messiness of life, and just like be able to triumph in some ways, smile at it, laugh at it or something, you know, and I think that does cultivate a sense of perspective and courage, which I'm sure has been very useful for him not to get just too caught up and embroiled in the fray of the, you know, deep suffering and loss that is happening, but also rise above it to be able to see some heroic possibilities, you know, right there. So, so yes, I mean, hats off. And I think in him lies the testament of the untapped potential there is, there is in all of us. Um, and then to your other question about what, you know, what I've gained, I mean, you know, life's just, um, you know, an ever unfolding journey. And I still see myself as just at the first step of, you know, the rest of this journey towards, you know, exploration of my fullest potential. But, you know, I'll just give you maybe one, one example, you know, around the self-realization energy, which has meant a lot to me. And that's, that's the energy about um, really kind of helping to uncover a sense of stillness and spirit, you know, within each of us that sort of lies beyond uh, our senses and perhaps even beyond our thoughts and our emotions, you know, to a place of, you know, just stillness and peace and attunement with nature and life and the universe, you know, beyond. And, you know, for me, that pathway, as you know, David, has been through meditation. And, and um, you know, here, here's just one fun story uh, that, that I would share. Uh, for me, the larger quest in meditation is the pursuit of joy, in, inner, unconditional welling up of joy from within and a sense of expansion of consciousness to feel a greater sense of attunement with um, more than just my physical body and my physical identity, with something that is more timeless, eternal, and universal. Um, but, but you know, that's a different story. I think just more simply put, one of the values of uh, you know, having a practice that sort of pulls you away from the fray is just the creativity that it can you know, sometimes just unleash in you just unexpectedly. And so this one time, I remember that um, I was, um, you know, at, at home uh, and it was my father's 80th birthday. And my mother asked me if I could uh, say some words in his honor uh, on that day because we were going to have some friends and family over. And um, all through the morning and the early afternoon, I took this honor that she was giving me and I really went on the serious quest to discover, like, what is it that I want to say about my dad? 
And I was struggling with it because all through our lives together, I had, you know, disagreed with him on many of the foundational areas of advice he'd given me. He'd asked me to, you know, encourage me to join the United Nations and I'd gone on, worked in business and he wanted me to stay in our hometown. And I went on to New Delhi and came to America, et cetera. And so I was like, you know, but I've actually done the opposite of what he said. So how has he actually left a meaningful and lasting mark on me? I was struggling with that. And then a few hours before the event itself, I was actually meditating. And suddenly in my meditation, all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle in my life, in my relationship with my father start to come together. And I get this deep insight, you know, unspoken insight from within, which is Hitendra, you have, of course, been deeply impacted by him. You have found him to be a very inspiring figure in your life. It had not much to do with what he was saying to you. It has a lot to do with how he lived his life. And then as soon as I got that insight, I started to curate through my memory list all the you know kind of highlights of what I've found in terms of his actions and reactions at different times. And then there was such a rich story to tell because I realized that over the course of my life, you know, at this point I was in you know around 30 or so, that I had had so much you know insight and wisdom I'd gained from um, many of the ways in which he had shown strength and resilience and servicefulness and you know, uh, just a great like sense of purpose, you know, at various points in his life. And I shared those stories. And I also recognized that unconsciously they had been deeply impacting me and that I'd come to a really good place um, in part based on these beautiful things that he had sort of, uh, you know, just imparted silently to me. And I don't think that insight, you know, would have come to me if I had locked myself, you know, in this frame of like, what has he advised me? And how has that advice actually affected me? that was the only path through which he's, he's actually had an impact on me. It took meditation to pull me away from that, uh, you know, from that idea. That's a beautiful story. I have another question for you. It's really kind of not consistent with anything we've been saying, but um, I, I know that you uh, spent a lot of time meditating. I, and I, this is going to sound so dopey, but I saw a cool program on PBS last night about consciousness. And I don't even remember the name of the program. I, I've turned it, uh, turned it on. It was halfway through, but it was some marine biologist. And she, she was saying that uh, uh, she, she, she would, uh, had spent a lot of time with these fish every day she'd go underwater in the ocean and and these certain fish and she got to know them actually and and they would come to her hands and you know she'd hold her hands out and they'd swim into her hands and stuff like that and then i think toward the end of her study she was going to have to capture them and kill them and study them or something like that and um, on on that day she she went into the water and and they didn't come to, to her hmm. and uh, and they'd come to her every day for months and she she, she made the interpretation that uh, they were kind of sharing her consciousness and they knew what what, 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 we, what was going to happen and it was really a transformative thing in her life and then she also went to Mexico and lived with some indigenous people who were in a kind of peyote thing and had some uh, peyote or psilocybin. And, 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 and she was talking about, and, and they had other people too, talking about how we think, ask the question, how does the brain create consciousness? And then this fellow says, you, you, you know, it, that can't be, you, you know, no matter how many billion neurons you get, it's not going to turn into consciousness and and bees and little animals i mean they have full consciousness with little, tiny little little brains and they were saying that consciousness is really a property of of the universe it's a basic property of of, of the universe and uh, i was so i'm going to be thinking about that 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 thing but I, I i can imagine that you've you've dealt in this kind of issue and experience things like this as as well uh, also one of the sad things with the indigenous people they they were about to sacrifice a cow and i i spent some time in rough rock arizona uh, uh, one summer and uh, you know the the people there it's a navajo reservation they, they don't have you know a lot of food and stuff and so it's every now and then they have to sacrifice an animal 
to you know to because uh, they can't just live on corn and and she said that this cow knew what was going to happen and because uh, they, they were going to slit its throat and I, I guess have a feast and she was talking talking about that too and how her consciousness was create was joined you know not only with these people but with this animal I, I just thought it was pretty moving and pretty profound uh, yeah thank you for sharing those are beautiful stories beautiful stories um i i in my last chapter of my book i uh, delve into the ultimate you know I, as i call it like destination you know in this journey towards uh, discovering your true self and i call it transcendence and um i relate uh, very much to this uh idea that consciousness may be a lot more than we have done justice to in our um, you know, view of seeing it in very mechanical terms as just a, a collection of neurons firing. Um, and in that chapter, I give some examples and stories of some of these um, you know, uh, ideas and truths and uh, stories that are beyond the rational mind in our capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah explain and i i related to mysticism you know this this uh quest that has been fairly timeless and fairly cross-cultural of some people wanting to go on deeper inner dives to understand um life reality truth their connection with the universe more through these kind of inner explorations of consciousness rather than purely in outer sensory engagement, you know, with the world and whether it's the Kabbalah traditions of Judaism or the Sufis in Islam or the yogis of India or the Buddhists and, and beyond. I mean, you, you find humankind questing, you know, for wanting to reach out and touch something a lot more timeless and, you know, intangible and sweet and beautiful, you know, than, and connected, you know, and, uh, and, and there are pathways to it that people have therefore developed. Um, I, I certainly am you know, like you said, from a very early stage in my life, been very you know invested and drawn to um, exploring those, and I, I found, in a sense, like my path to it. I recognize that there are many paths up the mountaintop, but um, that mountaintop, I, I'm you know, um, I'm in agreement with some of the you know observations that uh, these individuals are sharing in the documentary that you talked about, which is that um, we have no idea, we have no idea right now from where we are as to what awaits us there. And uh, all we may want to do is just surrender to the ever expanding, you know, nature of our consciousness. If we take on some of these, you know, practices on our own pathways, and they don't have to be the same pathway, they can be different pathways, as long as they're taking you up the mountain. And to me, the definition of going up the mountain is that we should feel increasingly happier, increasingly, you know, more harmonious in relationships, increasingly, you know, higher in our performance. And if we are, um, and hopefully it's helping our health as well then we're on to probably something good, you know? Yeah. And also it's connected to what you're saying because then she's saying that we're, we're one, the idea that we're uh, have a separate self is just an illusion. And, and that's also like the, the way you, co you connected with that, that fellow you th were thinking of him as an enemy, a, a separate. Yeah. And, and that when we get into enlightenment, that sense of a self, disappears and that's i guess what the buddha called the great death and uh and it's actually the great rebirth because you're you're waking up when 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 you're no longer feeling defensive or afraid of criticism uh, and uh and it is a joyous thing and it just feels so easy when you're in in it it seems like it's going to last forever oh i'm i'm really there now and then two or three days later you're back to your <laughs> ordinary irritable self again you've drifted out of enlightenment at least that's that's my experience but uh, that 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 spiritual peace that what one is saying i'm going to try to open my mind to to grasping that more because the whole puzzle of consciousness just never made sense to me like how, how this brain can create consciousness. And I know you talk about that a lot, Rhonda. I do. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you might start. Uh, well, can, I, can I bring us back to Earth? I mean, this, yeah, yeah, uh, just uh -huh. a little bit, because what you're talking about is really awesome and not something that we talk about very much. But one of the, you know, you invited me to read some of the writings that are on your website. And um, you wrote, 
or you were being interviewed about your belief about how we treat and how we work with people in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, and um, putting people in boxes and in taking people and no longer working like that with putting people in boxes in terms of their socioeconomic status or their demographic identity, like race, sex, gender, um, sexual pre preference, et cetera. And, and you're, what you wrote about was that you, your, your belief is that we need to move toward honoring each person for the individual that they are and being 100% present to each individual, which I found like kind of what you're talking about, enlightened and, and spiritual. But I'm wondering, you know, maybe, maybe this is off. And, but when people come to wor a work setting and they bring with them a, a like historical or institutional racism or they've experienced discrimination or how, how does that, um, how does your approach of seeing, honoring each person for the individual they are work within that environment where there might be institutional racism or discrimination? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I, I'm, you know, very happy with the way we are starting to challenge some unspoken uh, limiting practices and norms of the past, you know, in uh, various societies, certainly here in America, because it, it is much needed. And uh, I think, Ultimately, it'll take us to a good place, uh, you know, to be a more aware, connected, um, and uh, caring society. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think the idea that the way to get there is to actually, um, you know, really uh, fully identify with a certain set of social demographic parameters that are, you know, current in people's consciousness. Um, you know, for example, today, your gender is current, you know, to people's consciousness, your race is current to people's consciousness, uh, your sexual orientation is current, um, you know, whether or not you are, you know, a special needs is less current, it's less kind of out there, you know, uh, whether or not you are suffering from mental health is less out there, what kind of parenting you had is less out there, you know, did you come from a stable home or a broken home is less out there, you know, today, mm -hmm. right, in the way we quickly try to profile people and describe them. So we should recognize, first of all, that society is a work in progress, and that even while we are honoring some of these identities, there are many other identities that people may be hiding from you today, which we are not, like, finding yet very fashionable to talk about, right? So that's one part, which I think, uh, you know, just kind of humbles us to, to recognize that we, you know, society is still a work in progress. Now that said, I would also offer, you know, let's take somebody who, you know, overtly from the outside looks like they are black, and we therefore feel like that they've come with, um, you know, history of, of um, you know, the very painful, you know, past of enslavement that uh, must have inflicted their, you know, forefathers and and, and you know, ancestors here in the United States. Um, I've had some, um, you know, people of, you know, uh, you know, kind of like the black race, right, come to me and say, you know, I feel very uncomfortable about that because I actually come from the Caribbean. And where I grew up, everybody was black. And actually our presidents were black and our high achievers were black and all that. And I never grew up with any kind of, you know, view that, you know, my community in any way is less performing than because this was the community that I grew up in. So that's just like one story. I mean, I could give you so many where when you actually seek to assume that people must all monolithically have the same experience because they're all women or because they're all Democrats or because they're all you know, lesbians or because they're all white or something. It ends up making us lazy in not actually tuning into the full human self of that individual. And I would also go to the extent of arguing that the person that you met yesterday may actually be a different person from the one you meet today. Because let's say they have drifted in enlightenment or out of enlightenment between yesterday and today. Let's say they've had a real struggle with a certain relationship or a health issue at home in the last 24 hours. If you're just going to put them in a box and just have some you know, checklist of like, if people are this, 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 and this, then I'm meant to communicate in this, this, and this way. But if there's this, 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 and this, then I'm meant to communicate in this way. Then you don't do the hard work of actually taking a keen interest in their personal journey and in how they're feeling and what they're you know, aspiring for today, right? And so the quest or the intention is the same in the model that I'm offering and this uh, way in which we are shaking and waking the world up to saying, look, it's not just about all just the way men have wanted it and white men have wanted it. You know, I respect that. But um, I think the way to go beyond that is, you know, to me, 
not going to be fully completely met if we say that the ultimate progress is to now start having us all affirm seven or eight or 10 or 20 different identities, but to rather respect and honor and tune in to each individual for who they are. Now, while doing that, I'll also offer you a paradox. And the paradox I'll offer is that there is a whole different space we can go to of shared human connection, of our shared human identity, which is our human identity. It does not have to be our gender identity or a racial identity, it's a human identity. And that is a beautiful thing too, to actually be able to honor and connect and respect, you know, ask for who we are. You know, I'll give you an example. You know, you take somebody like a Martin Luther King, you know, we may make him out to be black, but actually, you know, the neurons that get lit up in our heads when we think of Martin Luther King is as a peacemaker, as an inspiring visionary of a way to create like a better world and all of that. And some part of that came from what he absorbed from Gandhi. Now, Gandhi was not black, Gandhi was brown, if you want to think about in terms of skin color. And so is Martin Luther King 100% completely just influenced by his ancestors or is he also influenced by Gandhi? He chose to be influenced by Gandhi. He chose to actually have part of his identity be created in part by borrowing some of the energy from Gandhi. Now, Gandhi, in turn, was very influenced by Leo Tolstoy and the transcendentalists in the United States. Can we truly call him Indian or brown when he borrowed so much of inspiration and guidance from some of their ideas about Tolstoy writing, you know, the kingdom of God is within you and this Christ kind of notion of forgiveness and, you know, kind of a peaceful loving approach to reforming people and all of that. Gandhi absorbed a lot of that in part from there. Now the transcendentalists absorbed a lot from the Indian scriptures, you know, of the Gita and all of that, right? And so, so when we open ourselves up, we start to see a lot of porosity a lot of sort of fluidity, a lot of cross, you know, cultural streams that have always existed in nature ever since humankind has started to communicate and travel and connect with people. Because there is something beautiful about just the human to human connection. And there's something powerful when you can strip us out of some of those, you know, um, you know, just kind of broad box identities into A, being just your true human self for who you are, but also finding that common chord that connects you to all the throbbing hearts in the world. Mm. Our interconnectedness. Yes, yeah. so true, so true. And maybe even beyond the human species, mm. you know, like that beautiful story that, you know, we just heard a couple of stories, right, from David about fish and cows. Right, exactly. You know, one of the things that you have in common with David is that you teach through storytelling. And, and that was... That's something I love in, in David's teaching and um, throughout your book are these magnificent, point, very poignant stories um, illustrating the points that you're making. Thank you. You know, I, I've had a few points of inspiration for that and one of them certainly is David. Um, I, I, you know, in, in India's, um, some of India's greatest epics have been basically offering wisdom for millennia, but through stories. Uh, my spiritual master, Yogananda, his... Um, a lot of his teaching was through his autobiography, which was all full of stories. And when I read like feeling good and, you know, when, when panic attacks and, um, you know, feeling good together and others of David's works, you know, I was, and when I saw David in action, you know, at many of his workshops, I was like, wow, what a consummate storyteller. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate that. It, it's fun to tell stories and to bring things to life that way. Because you can talk theoretically, and, and people don't know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. And once you tell tell a story, you can kind of see something you hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, mm. so true. The other thing I've noticed that you both have in common is that you both approach every moment when you're either with a client or a patient or students or just in life with a sense of curiosity about what's going to happen next. Wow, that's an interesting observation. Thank you for sharing that, Rhonda. I hadn't really seen myself that way, but um, maybe to build on the last point, um, you know, I guess at some point you start to find a certain intrigue in how anytime something is happening in life, there is a story that is unfolding and you don't know yet where that story will go and how, where it will end and how you connect the dots and what you make of it. So um, as someone who has a hobby of like collecting stories, you know, that's one way that uh, life stays very interesting because you just never know what the possibilities are that this could be one of those amazing stories that is happening around me today. 
I don't know, David, if that relates, you know, if you relate to that idea or how. Well, yeah, I mean, when you're curious, I mean, life can be so fantastically exciting and adventuresome. It can be pretty awful, too. You know, I'm always treating people who are depressed and uh, and oppressed. And and we all hit bumps in the road that are horribly painful sometimes. Uh, And uh, I know you understand that very well, Rhonda, from, you know, some recent recent blows you've received that were totally unjustified and and awful but yes uh, you know people can can be just fantastic uh, our son uh, was living with us for a while and he just moved over to to Santa Cruz and he suddenly realized that there's eight women for every man <laughs> and uh, he's, he, he brightened up tremendously and he's having a lot of fun and it's just it's great to see how you know how exciting it can be just to that, that's why i've always loved california but it has nothing to do with california just lo- life but i've always felt that california is a place of magic and uh, ama- amazing adventures are or possible. Of course, I'm an old fart now, and I don't go too far from my adventure from my own house. But I got my kitty up here on the on the perch, and uh, yeah, the uh, I, I just feel so blessed. Uh, we've been getting fantastic results w- w- with our app. It's uh, I don't I don't know if I had time to t- tell you this, Tenra, but we uh, uh, our recent one day beta test. The the average reduction in seven different emotions was seventy four percent, which is almost double what you see in human uh, st- uh, treatment that that goes on for eight nine months. And so I, I just calculated. I think I t- told you I, I had this idea of recovery coefficient. H- how much recovery can you get in one day? That that's your effectiveness. And and so the human. Uh, uh, all the human outcome studies, it's been one quarter of 1% per day reduction in like the score on the Beck depression test or my own depression test or whatever. And um, so our app is more than 200 times more powerful than human therapists or, or, or medications. And uh, it's we're, we're just so excited by, by that. Now we're doing what happens after that one day. Is everyone going to relapse? How are we going to deal with, with following that one day? But it's just so exciting to have people working together and creating to, to, together and making something, something happen. Uh, I'm just babbling, but, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that's something I'm just very grateful for. I'm grateful to know you and grateful to have you, Rhonda, in, in my life. It's pretty fantastic. Yeah, congratulations awesome. for that. Uh, congratulations for that effect. Yeah, that is amazing. It's beautiful. Um, it, uh, you know, speaks so, so much to your thesis, which um, I know so many that I have uh, introduced that idea to have really uh, valued, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, it's about states, not traits. Yeah, um, and just liberating yourself from any limiting view that your mental condition is permanent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, so if you have some final comments or parting messages about your new book, uh, Inner Mastery, Outer Impact, which people I'm sure can find on Amazon uh, very easily now. Uh, the, the, this this is your shot. Why should people care about Hitendra and Hitendra's uh, amazing new book? Yeah, well, if you're very happy, already on a good path in life, and not really needing or seeking much more, then I don't really want to disrupt that beautiful equilibrium state that you might be in. Hmm. But on the other hand, if you're drawn to the idea of integrating your inner life with your outer life, of wanting to approach, you know, uh, ambition and aspiration and success on the outside, but from a place of deep grounding on the inside that connects with who you think you truly are. And at times you struggle, you know, with that interface, with uh, bringing harmony between your inner and outer. Then I hope that the stories, the science, some of the frameworks and ideas in the book may be of some service to you. I'm very, very grateful, David. Okay, I have one last yeah, yeah. I have one last dorky question for you, but that was beautifully stated. That was great, uh, Hitendra. You you talk about ancient wisdom, and everyone wants to know what is ancient wisdom. 
So can you give us a piece of ancient wisdom? That might be too stupid of a question, but like, what would be an example of ancient wisdom? Yeah, I respect that. So for you know the last hundred years, we've really honored science as the vehicle through which we are discovering you know what we think is truth, and we feel like we are doing much better than past generations. And certainly, if you look at the dark ages, the last 50, 500, 600, you know, thousand years, it looks you know it looks that way. But if you go back, you know, 2,000 years, 4,000 years, 5,000 years, what you'll find is that across cultures, there has been a tribe of what you might call truth seekers, you know, who were just very drawn to the idea of like, who am I? What's my relationship with the universe and life? What's the secret to enduring happiness? You know, just the same questions that existentially and, you know, otherwise in the conduct of our day-to-day -day affairs, we are drawn to. And so to me, uh, when I talk about ancient wisdom, I'm referring to the fact that I find much more in common across the spiritual traditions of the world than, um, than apart, i.e. they're not as you know, separate and as much in, um, in, in, in conflict with each other as it might look when we think in terms of institutionalized religion, where sometimes there have been certain messengers and certain you know, institutionalized figures that may have claimed that you know, my faith and my path is right and others are wrong. No, actually, if you go back to certainly the mystics who were seeking to run a lot of inner experiments and to become inner scientists and to seek to discover truth through the instrumentalities of their own mind, um, I think you'll start to see that actually speaking, just like David, you were referring to a while back, so much of what today psychology is uncovering is not new. It's actually just affirming and reconfirming something that these ancient spiritual traditions have known. You asked me for one example, David, the practice of gratitude. You know, another would be the practice of mindfulness and meditation as a pathway to greater happiness, greater health, greater well-being, and greater joy. You know, from within, um, the, um, the 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 commitment and ownership over your own mind to regulate it, observe it, and shift it when it's not working in the right way for you. You know the path of stoicism of the past, past. You know combined today with the very, very. We are getting really practical tools today from science, and really practical advice and guidance. The app that you talk, you know, about blows my mind. You know the discipline and logic and clarity with which David you do your work and what you offer to us is is wonderful, beautiful, and it is you know net you know a huge value add over some of this traditional ancient kind of wisdom, uh, and yet it builds on it. You know it uh, re. Um, you know, validates, you know, many of those ideas and truths of, of the past uh, around practices like empathy, compassion, kindness, uh, and all being the good virtues, you know, through which we end up becoming the best versions of ourselves individually and collectively. So the mystics, the truth seekers of the past, the inner experimentation and the inner science as something that today outer science is starting to, with its outer instruments, you know, validate. Mm. Well, thank you so much. It's an honor and, and a pleasure, as always, to see you and to shoot, shoot the breeze a little bit today. And I'm sure our listeners are going to be so excited to, to learn more about this fantastic message and realm of, of finding who you are, uh, what's my purpose in the, in the universe. Uh, the, the, those are pretty, pretty exciting, pretty exciting stuff right there. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you as well, Rhonda. It's been a joy to be here with both of you. And David, of course, my thanks to you extends beyond just the present session to all that you stand for and all that you've done to help me get so much more educated and the best that we can access today. Awesome. Great. Have a, have a good day. And uh, I'll write up the show notes, uh, which I do very quickly. They're rough, rough drafts, so you can edit them and change them all you want, Pol polish them up. I just I, I have an anti-perfectionism mindset, so I just put something down and send it out and let people change it and correct it and whatever. So, okay, thanks again. Thanks very much. Thank nice you. Nice to meet you, Rhonda. Yeah, very nice to meet you. Yeah, My yeah. pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website, at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. 
I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, the director of the Feeling Great Therapy Center. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.